Well, here we are again, folks. This is Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. I have visited houses that had a bookcase with all novels. One novel behind the other that some author wrote. And I would make a comment. You must like that author. And, oh yes, that's the best author I've ever seen. Everything she's ever wrote, I've got it. Well, let me tell you what. This Holy Bible was authored by God. He is the head author. Now, he had many writers. Now, I'm sure that that person that had all of those books had many writers of those books. That lady set or sent uh, a script to somebody and said, print this or put it out or do something. And, and had used other people to get where she is and have other people write in her, in her books stories and she put them in and they're not actually out of her mind but somebody else's mind but written in her book. Well this is what this book is, the Bible. It is the book of God written by God's people. In the book of Philippians, this is where we are right now, we're going to, if you would pause your machine, get a Bible out with the book of Philippians in it and open up to it and find a place uh, probably either in the, right in the front or in the back where it has a breakdown of the book and see what it says about it. Where was the church? The church was at a place called Philippi. That's why it's called the book of the church of Philippians. What was the second thing about it? It was apparently one of Paul's favorite churches. Now we find as we open up some writings that look like it's right there in that day and just happened. This is 10 years. This is 10 years after Paul had started this church and this church was still flourishing. It was still going. They hadn't strayed away in 10 years from what Paul had taught them. And they came under the blessings of God because the Apostle Paul walked across that country, won them to the Lord, and God spoke to their heart and showed them how to do some things that caused them to come under the Roman citizenship and be protected by Rome. They were a place that was under Macedonian rule because they were in Macedonia. But the Macedonian rule was worse than the Roman rule. Now the Roman rule was, was uh, difficult in times. If you followed it, you didn't have a problem. But if you broke their rules, you had a real serious problem and you'd die. <clears throat> well, the Macedonians undoubtedly, evidently, were worse than the Romans in the sense of the word. And those that were in Philippi didn't like being under Macedonian rule. So here comes the Romans, and Paul the Apostle comes by, and uh, the Romans ran out of salt. Well, the Romans that were in Macedonia, that, that tr group that had been sent there, uh, no telling, I don't know how many men there were in a squad or whatever, but how many men were there. Let's just say, for the sake of a number, that there were 300 Romans there around about that area and they were trying to take over that area and make it a Roman colony. Well, the only way they could do it is they had to have a way to be paid. Well, they had run out of salt. Well, in that day, salt was so valuable, it was used as pay. So these Roman soldiers were paid with a bag of salt. So they got a bag of salt, and they had to have that salt. You have to have salt to consist on this earth. The human body, the animal body, is made to have to have a certain amount of salt in order to be able to live comfortably and properly and whatever. So, and another thing is, you couldn't keep, in that day, you couldn't keep a piece of meat. If you killed a squirrel or a rabbit, and that, you, that rabbit was going to last you two, or three, four days, you had to cut that meat off that rabbit, put it in a bag of salt, and salt it down and keep it in that salt 
and it would cure and it's called salt curing and it would cure in that salt and you could take out that piece of uh, meat that had cured for a few days or whatever lay it in the sun my father-in-law used to cure a fish I used to love it man did I love it he cured that fish with salt and he laid it out there on the screen and he salted it down all over and let the sun shine on it. Put another screen over the top of it to keep the flies off it. And he made that. And, and, and what you could do is you peel that salt fish off the skin. And, and man, or, or it was filleted and it was just meat. And you could rip that off and put it in your mouth and chew it. You could carry it around in your pocket. You could put it in a bag and carry it on your side. And... Uh, You'd have salt fish anytime you wanted it to keep you alive and give you all the nourishment you needed to give you what you needed plus some salt in your body. And the salt was the, one of the most important things, has been, ever since the, a human being has been on this earth, salt has been one of the most important things uh, on this earth. And salt was worth its weight in gold in that day. It was worth its weight in gold in America when America was founded that everybody had a salt box in the house. I actually remember living in a house that had the old salt box in it uh, between the pantry. Our house was up north and we had the house. And then we had the little uh, outhouse was built onto it so you could go outside of the door and go into the outhouse, the back house. And then next to that was a pantry uh, that had things in it. It had a salt box in it you could open up. It, had, it was full of salt and you could salt stuff down and keep it. And now this was, uh, refrigerators were not a, a great thing in that day. In my younger days, I'm only 76, but I remember in my younger days, the old refrigerator that came out that had the old thing on top of it and it made all kinds of racket and, and it cooled stuff. It was a little small box with a great big motor. and. Uh, but, but they were getting away from using salt the way they used it. But salt cured food was food cured from now on. You could carry it on you uh, until any way you went and you could uh, live on it for a long, long time. You could uh, carry it and live on it for a long time. So it was one of the most important things there was. Well, uh, around Macedonia, there were some salt mines, and the people uh, at this church at Philippi, they had salt. But they wanted to be the Romans. God had sent the Romans in there. Now the Romans thought they came in there for this reason, to rule Macedonia. And they did end up ruling the Macedonians, but the church at Philippi were the ones that helped them do that, because the church at Philippi wanted to be under Roman rule because the Romans weren't so hard on them as the Macedonians were. So now we have this, this system going on. Thus the church conceived in a vision would reach its apex in a prison stage and wonderful indeed are the ways of God. This was the third thing that happened there and the city of Philippi was founded in Macedonia. Now, uh, uh, the father of Alexander the Great in 357 was named after it. It was 700 miles from Rome. Now listen to this. This is a place 700 miles from Rome. Uh, we can uh, liken things today to other things. I was born in the state of Maine. I lived some 2,000 miles from there now, 1,700 miles from where I was born in the state of Georgia. But I'm still being used of God now in the state of Georgia and some 2,000 miles away. Yet I have pen pals that live in Maine, still write letters and, and still do things the old-fashioned way and actually write letters and receive letters. Don't think it, take it light if you ever get a letter from somebody and return it with a letter. Return a letter from that one that wrote you a letter. If you get a Christmas card, return the thanks for that card uh, in writing. It's not a common thing today for somebody to go out of their way and write a letter. 
many people today just use your telephone and they send you a Merry Christmas or Happy New Year or whatever on your telephone. But it's a whole other matter when somebody sends you a piece of mail. Not only that, it's a half a buck. It's 50 cents and sometimes 70 cents or more to send you a Christmas card or a card or a birthday card. And by the way, somebody thought about your birthday during that period of time. We have got to, get, I have got to get on the ball and I have lost a, a piece of very, very, very important piece of paper that I had on a family in Maine. They had all their birth dates and everything in it. I have misplaced it. I've got to get another one so that I don't miss their birthdays and whatever. So it's very important that we have connection. And, and these people needed connection with the Romans and they got it. Roman conquest in the Middle East had been encouraged by the war against Macedonia. History tells us that the Roman army ran out of salt. Now we get this from the history books, that they ran out of salt. And uh, we also have a record of it in the Bible. And it was with salt that the Roman soldiers were paid. From this we get the expression, a man is not worth his salt. And the Roman Legion Theater to defect uh, and return home from the battle. But by the way, this was a group of Roman soldiers that were out on battle, which meant that the Macedonians would remain unconquered. Well, the people of Philippi preferred to be ruled by Rome and then by Macedonia. So they collected an, a great amount of salt and turned it over to the Roman army. And thus the soldiers were paid. Uh, they, conti they continued in their conquest and defeated the Macedonians and incorporated Macedonia into the Roman Empire. Now listen to this one. I've got all of that. I read all of that stuff right there just to get to this point. Now listen to this. A reward to the citizens of Philippi, the Roman emperor conferred upon them the status of a colony. <laughs> Paul comes in, he starts a little church. Ten years later, this church and this group of people become a colony within its own country. This meant they had the same rights and privileges as Roman citizens did and the residents of the city of Rome. They were under special protective care of the emperor. They had all the privileges afforded by Roman law. Like residents of Rome, they were given privileges of freedom from taxation. They had been made Romans although they lived in Macedonia. As a conquest, many of the Roman soldiers chose to settle in Philippi. So now they've got a mixed group of people there. And in return to Italy, after they had completed their military service, thus Philippi became a little Rome. Rome in its loyalties, Rome in its law, Rome in its philosophy, Rome in its outlook, it was here that the apostle came to begin to uh, penetrate the continent of Europe with a gospel of salvation. Grace through faith. That's the exact same gospel you and I have today. We have grace through the faith. I live in a little town called Grantville, Georgia, a little bitty town. I live under the grace of that town, if you please. Uh, the grace is not, <laughs> not, <laughs> uh, not very graceful when you get your utility bill, and especially in the wintertime when the rates go up. You get your gas bill, especially in the wintertime when the rates go up. Uh, especially if there's any hardship across the country, the gasoline rates go up. And you have that all over the place. It's called greed. People are greedy and they live off of somebody else's impoverishment uh, by doing that. But the joy of living, this is the important thing. In Philippi, that's because of the first European city to receive the gospel 
and also hear the first Christian concert, uh, which features a special uh, uh, diet at midnight. <laughs> the first spiritual concert is going to be from a jailhouse at midnight. And A.D. 57, at the end of the third mission journey tip, trip, some five years after his first visit, Paul seems to have paid two brief visits to Philippi. We see that in 2 Corinthians 1 and 16 and in the book of Acts, chapter 19, 21, uh, verses 20 through 1 through 3. In A.D. 62, finds the apostle a prisoner in Rome. Uh, let's look at Paul the prisoner. Now, Paul the prisoner appeals to Caesar. He's 700 miles from Rome. He appeals to go to be taken to Caesar personally. Well, this is going to take a long period of time. So while he is appealing, they put him in chains and they chain him to a guard. Listen to this. Uh, this finds him a prisoner in Rome in Acts indicates he was confined to his own hired house. Now Paul had a house that he had hired. hired. It was his house. So he suggests to the Roman people, look, let's use my house. If you think I'm going to run away or escape, you just go ahead and chain a prisoner to me. And so they did. They chained various Roman soldiers. Every six hours, they changed the guard. So every six hours, Paul was chained to a different Roman citizen. Although he could not preach in public, he was allowed to write. So here, this is what Paul knew. If he appealed to Caesar that he would be kept in this place, he would be kept in safety, whether he was chained to a guard or not, I'm sure the guards got to know Paul real well and said, well, you aren't going anywhere. No, let's take the chain off today. I'll sit over here in the corner and you go ahead and write and uh, tell me about this God you have. And I'm sure that Paul won many of these. We know he won the jailers to the Lord when he was in the prison. And um, it was therefore at this time some 10 years after his original visit to Philippi, that Paul wrote the epistle of Philippians, it was his favorite church. This church, upon learning of his imprisonment in Rome, had sent a love offering to him by way of Epaphroditus. They had already sent him two other love gifts years back for his missionary endeavors in Thessalonica. Philippians 4, 15 and 16. Are you watching Ph. tidbits? Are you learning? Are you listening? Do you know somebody, either close by or far off, that you can send a gift to? My mother and father were some of the poorest human beings that ever lived. I've got a suitcase upstairs that my mama left behind of letters and I get them out and read them. All the way from back in the 40s, my mother and father sent people dollar bills, two dollars, five dollars, and I see letters saying, thank you, daughty, I needed that two dollars. Thank you, daughty, I needed that five dollars. Thank you, daughty, for your love offering. We desperately needed it. And mom and daddy wrote letters they got anywhere from uh, 50 to 100 or more Christmas cards at Christmas. They wrote letters constantly. My daddy had suitcases full of letters from people thanking him for their little love offerings. Have you sent a love offering to somebody lately? I fail. I fail. I fail. I don't mind saying I fail. I've been burdened now for a solid month to get something off to some of my friends. I'm living uh, in a condition right now with a, uh, a, a wife that has terminal cancer. And if you don't be careful during this period of time 
you devote all your time to, to this person you've lived with, and I've lived with her for 54 years, and I don't mind. It's my privilege to devote my time to her, but I need to take time to write letters and to get them off in the mail and to send to people that I know that could use a letter. I love a letter. I love it when I get a card or a letter from somebody that could just boop, 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 text me on the phone. That's one thing, but to sit down and pen a letter and send it, that's another whole matter. I need to get on the ball on that. I fail in that area. Okay, they, they had sent Paul, and Paul took note of it that in Rome. Epaphroditus had been very ill and nearly died, but God spared his life. Paul thus writes to Philippi both to thank them for their gift also to report the good news of the Epaphras recovery. That's very important. It's very important to have a handwritten thing from somebody. And uh, there are three bywords in this epistle. One is Christ found in various forms is seven, said some 70 times that and Christ is found in various forms. One of the words is joy. If you have Christ in your heart, you have joy in your heart, which is said 18 times in this epistle. The third is mind, mentioned 12 times in here. Let your mind be stayed on Jesus Christ, the one who has given you the freedom to be able to live in this world without condemnation. I'm not condemned by this world in my own heart because I follow what God said. And then the other one is Christ, the purpose of life. Chapter 1 is all about that. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. <coughs> and these times for me, with my wife uh, preparing to go to heaven, is gain for her. She, she may leave before I do. That will leave a big hole in my life but it will also leave a place where I can go to work and get things done in the Lord that I need to get done too. So, and I can look forward to being with her one day forever. Her and I will be joined in heaven forever. Uh, marriage is forever. It's not just for this world, it's forever. Christ, the purpose of life, chapter 1. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, 121. Causing Paul to rest in God's security. If you're not in God's security, you have no security. The only security that we have in life is God. He is our security. He is the only one we can bank on to, that carries us to heaven. And uh, have you got on the plane yet to heaven? Have you had said, Jesus, I'm a sinner, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul, and got on that plane? You got your ticket paid for when you say that. It's a gift, a free gift. His greeting to the saints at Philippi, he writes to the saints. He also writes to the bishops and the deacons. Now, what is a bishop? A bishop is a man that does a little different work than a deacon does. But anybody can be a bishop or a can do a deacon's job whether he is a quote, quote, appointed deacon or not. I have never been an appointed deacon. My name has been put on the roster many times and I tell people, do not vote for me, I will not be a deacon on the roster. I am already a deacon, but I am a deacon unrecognized off from the roster. What does a deacon do? He gets out of his car in the morning and he's walking across the parking lot to the church. And there's a paper cup somebody threw out rolling around back and forth in the wind in the parking lot. What do you do? You pick it up and take it with you and put it in the trash can. You just did the job of a deacon. There's a gum paper. You're leaving the church. You sit down near the front. You're walking back up. Several people have left and they've left candy papers, gum papers and stuff on the seat. 
They've left bulletins. What do you do? You pick them up. You take them to the vestibule and put them in the trash can before you walk out. You just did a deacon's job. You did a deacon's job. So you're standing in the vestibule on Sunday morning and people are coming in. And you shake their hand and say good morning and say, hey, uh, you're new. We appreciate you coming today. Where are you from? And they say, well, I'm visiting from so-and-so, so-and-so, and uh, they told me to come to this church. So they came in and you welcome them. You do the job of a bishop. So, so what is a deacon? What is a bishop? That's an active person in a place of God, a worship place. That is an active person. If you're an active person in that place, then you have the, the uh, without having the, it wrote down on a piece of paper, that's what you are. Now, if it's wrote down on a piece of paper, that's a, some recognition that causes you to have to follow it because of the recognition. But you can be a deacon or a bishop without the recognition. You do it all your life. And then, so it also writes bishops and deacons, mentions the bishops and deacons, uh, advanced state of organization in the church. Philippi now composed of mature, gifted believers. How do you become a mature, gifted believer? You get in the Word of God, and you follow the Word of God, what the Word of God says. You go listen to the preacher, what, one hour a week? Sunday morning, and don't come back Sunday night. Don't come in on Wednesday night. Just three hours a week. Do you know there's 168 hours in a week? Do you know that you owe God 16.8 hours of relationship with Him one-on-one -on -one every week? That's 10% of your time. God said we owe 10% of every single waking hour. We owe 10%. So, if it's got 60 minutes in it, what's 10%? We owe God 10% of that time during the week. That is 16.8 hours out of 168 hours. Well, some people say, well, I, I give my whole Sunday to God. I worship all day Sunday. Well, good. Good. That's probably eight hours. What do you do with it? Where's the other eight come in? Well, I go Wednesday night takes two hours, so that's 10 and uh, so now you've got 10 hours in, you're six hours short, point eight. What are you going to do with that period of time? You can study your Bible at home. You can give that time to the Lord and get your 10% uh, uh, in. If it's 24 hours in a day, then you owe God to, uh, over two hours a day and time that is spent for Him. Uh, worship time in the morning, prayer time, Bible reading study, talking to people about the Lord, uh, calling people for the church, doing things that are involved in God over two hours a day. You have to do over two hours a day, every day. Six days a week, seven days a week. You got to do it. So this is what makes you a called a Christian. What is a Christian? He is an active, ongoing Christ follower. That's what a Christian is. He's an ongoing Christ follower. You got to be a Christ follower if you want fellowship with Christ. The, what is the purpose of life? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We just said that. Causing Paul to rest in God's security. His greeting to the saints at Philippi. He writes to the saints. He also writes to the bishops and deacons. And he mentions the bishops and deacons indicating an advanced state of organization of the church at Philippi now composed of mature and gifted believers from whom recognized leaders had come as uh, is noted that the earliest epistles were bishops, deacons mentioned, and only one where they are separately addressed. There's only one place right here they were separately addressed. Otherwise, they were just the common, everyday believer who did the things they were supposed to do. Of course, as early as Acts 6, men were appointed in the church to serve in a way similar to deacons. Although not called deacons, 
the preeminence, preeminence was appointed to them. Hey, when I was in the, on the mission field for a while in Mexico, I learned some customs that those uh, Mexican people brought a sack lunch with them and stayed until the evening service. So they were going to stay at the church all day. So they got together after the uh, meeting and they ate their tortillas and their uh, packed up stuff that won't spoil in a hundred and something degree weather and no refrigerator. Uh, <clears throat> coming from the United States where we're spoiled, uh, it was very difficult for me to get used to that type of eating and I thought maybe everything I ate might kill me because I'm so spoiled <clears throat> from the way we live in America. That these people got wrapped up in paper bags and in cloth totes and all kinds of stuff. Some tortillas and some uh, hot sauce and some stuff. And uh, around the church they got an old frying pan around there or something and they built an open fire and they put the pan on the open fire and they cook on it, and they throw the tortillas on there, flip them over, and they, the sparks fly upward and then downward. You get it in your, your food, and, and you eat it, and, and you live. <laughs> a different, a different mentality, a different thing. But and, and that's what you get when you go on a mission field. That's what you start with. So we saw the men in special service were appointed to different things in that service. And we find the triumph in Christ. Now let's look at uh, the triumph. Uh, the Greek word translated for bishop is pursuit of an overseer in, in any capacity of, the, of that sense the official in charge of the repairing of the temple. That was a guy working repairing the temple. He might not have had anything to do with anybody else physically in that place, but he had to do with keeping the, the altar patched up, keeping it where it could be walked up on without steps flipping over, keeping the place up, patching the roof when it rained so the rain wouldn't come in the, the building. And this was a, an office of that type. That's what the office was. It was not just talking to people. It was not just writing. It was not just doing secretarial work, but it was doing physical work. And uh, <clears throat> hey, we have many, many men in our church who are not on the deacon board who are deacons. We have many men at our church who are, are uh, they do things all the time. They've done things for years, and they're not not their name is not on the deacon board, but they are deacons. The Bible said it's one thing to be a called deacon; it's another thing to be a self-appointed deacon. That means you do the office of deaconship without reward, or without saying, "Look at me, I'm doing this," and then. The well, spiritual welfare of the local church is put in the hands of a certain group of deacons. And so, and they are servants in the spiritual sense. Then we have deacons do the physical sense. The final note here, the word deacon comes from a compound Greek word meaning to stir up the dust. Well, how you stir up the dust? You take a broom and you sweep. <laughs> you stir up the dust. That's the job of a deacon. Uh -huh. <clears throat> it presents a picture of one who moves rapidly through the dusty lanes of the village. That means that he's out there telling people about Jesus and goes quickly as he does it. Uh, <clears throat> I remember my first years of salvation. Uh, I ran a bus route. And our church required, if you run a bus route, you give your whole Saturday to the bus route. That means you couldn't work on Saturday because you're out knocking doors. You give your whole Saturday. You get up early in the morning and, and wear yourself out until you're so tired you can't hardly walk in the house when you get home. But let me tell you what, the joy of doing that 
when you take your bus out on Sunday morning and you pick up 30, 32 children and you bring them to the church and they get a way of life. And I tell you what, visiting those houses every week, at least once a week, finding out the need, helping them. Some of them you carry a loaf of bread. Some of them you might carry a jar of peanut butter. Some of them you do something for them. Some of them don't have a car. And they say, Mr. Peter, can you take me to the store? I need to go to the store, and I don't have a way there. And you take them to the store. There's somebody in the family gets sick. Rather than call the preacher, they call you. You're the bus driver. You're their mentor. You're the one that comes and gets them when they need something. You have a church within the church. Now you need to be careful. You don't try to build you a church within the church. You steal the people out of that church. I've seen that happen um, over and over and over again. Through the years, I've seen people who got promoted a little bit and they became good deacons and good stewards and then they turned out to be a bad, do a bad thing. They took a group of people from that church and went over somewhere else and started another church with a group of people that was very important to be in that church because God put them in that church so that they could support that church with their 10% tithe, which is a very necessary thing in every church. I don't care how big the church is. That 10% of that person is very important in that church. God put them there for more than one reason. One reason is is that that support to keep the lights on. Somebody said, ah, they don't need my money. Well, no, they don't. God needs it, though. But that light bill in our church comes around about $2,600 or $3,000 a month on a low month. On a month we do something special, it's more than that. That's got to be paid. We support some $13,000 as far as I know right now worth of missionary money every month goes out of our church. No matter how small the crowd gets, that doesn't change. It's set up on that. It's $13,000 if that's all we take in. If we promise them missionaries that money, we've got to send it. And so it's important. And there are a lot of things that are important, but when you come and you steal 25 or 30 or as many as 300, 250 people, or 275 people away and start another church, you're a thief and a robber. And a punishment will come down the road later on it will happen to you usually what you do comes back home and usually it comes back home in the same way that you did it you're going to get it back against you so that's down the road that's down the road right now uh we we are like philippi we're a little church with a small group of people and we're like starting over again we have a large piece of property and we need funds to develop that property into a place for people to come. Uh, we want a camp that can be used 24 sevens for 12 months a year, every day for 12 months a year, 365 days a year to be used in a capacity to house and help and teach and, and mentor and have a library and have a camp and have everything that we need it takes finances 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 which we don't have which we're praying for that god would send the finances not to use of our own physical use but for the use to grow other people to help other people so boys and girls can come to camp so those that are wayward for the unhoused in our city, those that are without a place to live can come and find a place, place where people will treat them right, a place where they can get introduced back into a workforce, back into a place where their lives don't have meaning, back into a place that they have lost that place in their life. A lot of times come and gone, we're getting up into the 40 minute thing, and hardly anybody will punch on to a tidbit that's over 30 minutes. And this day and age, we have people 
with uh, not wanting to give themselves to good learning. They're too busy punching buttons on a, a telephone for a bunch of junk, a bunch of games that mean nothing, have nothing. They rob you of your brain power. They rob you of what you could do that's deity. That means something that goes on forever. And they rob you of that. Uh, you need to be careful of your time. Your time belongs to you and God, not just you, but it belongs to God. So you must give him your 16.8 hours a week and study and going on and doing things for God. I've got to leave. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.